Mr. City Clerk, let us go to the joint meeting of the Glendale City Council, the Glendale Redevelopment Agency, and Glendale Housing Authority uh, on the uh, matter of in lieu fees. Okay. And first, let me call to order the joint meeting of the Glendale City Council, the uh, Glendale Housing Authority, and the Glendale Redevelopment Agency, and ask you, please, sir, if you would read, uh, call the roll. Council members Njarian? Here. Quintero? Here. Weaver? Here. Yusefian? Here. Mayor Draymond? Here. For the redevelopment agency, please. Agency members Draymond? Here. Quintero? Here. Weaver? Here. Yusefian? Here. Chairman Njarian? Here. Housing? Authority members Draymond? Here. Mincy? Here. Njarian? Here. Parazian? Here. Quintero? Here. Weaver? Here. Chairman Yusefian? Here. Thank you very much, Mr. City Clerk. Uh, could you uh, read the report, please? Uh, one is Director of Community Development and Housing regarding discussion of inclusionary housing in lieu fees update for San Fernando Road Corridor Redevelopment Project Area. At 1A is Council Resolution readopting and amending the inclusionary housing in lieu fees with options. And 1B is Council Motion granting a waiver of the in lieu fee for a project at 1838 South Brown Boulevard. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Um, we have some cards here, but before we go to the public, let me first turn to our to Madeline Blake, who is seated there on the far right end of the dais. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council and the Housing Authority and the Redevelopment Agency. Uh, in December 2004, the Housing Authority and Redevelopment Agency and City Council approved an inclusionary housing program for the San Fernando Road Corridor Redevelopment Project Area in order to ensure compliance with California redevelopment law which requires that 15% of all new units developed in a redevelopment project area be restricted at affordable housing costs to very low, low and moderate income households. Within the 15% requirement, 6% must be affordable to very low income households and 9% must be affordable to low or moderate income households. The inclusionary housing policy which ado was adopted at that time provides for the requirement to be met on a project by project basis using one of four alternatives building the affordable units on site, building the affordable units off site inside the area, building the affordable units off site outside the area, which actually requires a two for one, um, or paying an in lieu fee, uh, a fee in lieu of building the units. The in lieu fee is actually the affordability gap or the difference between the achievable market rate price, sales price and or rents and the affordable sales price and or rents. The fee is what it would cost the housing authority basically to develop the equivalent units in the project area. Policy calls for developers who choose the option of paying the fee to submit an inclusionary housing plan and to pay the fee at the time they pull, pull their building permits, at which time it would be deposited into an inclusionary housing trust fund for the development of affordable housing. In December 2004, based on an economic analysis, the in lieu fee was calculated at $29 a square foot for ownership housing and $39 a square foot for rental housing. At that time, a conservative in lieu fee was established um, by the agencies and council of $17 a square foot. In 2006, an economic update was conducted. At that time, the in lieu fee was calculated to be $38 a square foot for ownership housing and $40 a square foot for rental housing. Since the impact of the uh, significant zoning changes for the San Fernando Road area had not yet to be seen and no development had occurred, the council and agencies again reaffirmed the in lieu fee at $17 a square foot. Given that it's been two years and the current state of the housing market, Kaiser Marston and Associates was requested to pro provide an, up an updated economic analysis of the in lieu fee. Their analysis concluded a number of things, uh, that the in the in lieu fee was calculated to be $35 a square foot for ownership housing and $36 a square foot for rental housing or a decrease of 7.4% for ownership, 10% for rental housing. According to the Real Estate Research Council, new home prices in Los Angeles County have decreased 18%. They concluded that development of ownership projects are generally not economically feasible at this time with or without the in-lieu fee, and that development of rental projects are economically feasible and can support the in-lieu fee. To date, no market rate residential units have been developed and no in-lieu fees have been collected. 
There have been five residential projects proposed for the San Fernando Road project area for a proposed total of approximately just over 800 units. The potential in lieu fee amount to, that would be collected for these projects would total about $12.8 million. That would be used for developing affordable housing. To date, developers of four of the proposed projects have indicated that if they were to develop their project, they intend to meet their inclusionary housing obligation by paying the in lieu fee. The remaining developer has indicated that either constructing the affordable units or paying the in lieu fee makes their project infeasible. So staff is now requesting direction from the City Council Housing Authority and Redevelopment Agency. The City Council takes the action. Um, as to the direction with regard to the in lieu fee, um, staff has offered eight possible alternatives and uh, Mike Garcia just passed out um, um, we hope to revive them. <laughs> uh, and they, they range from maintaining the fee to decreasing uh, the fee based on the drop in housing prices, <coughs> based on the drop in the in lieu fee calculation, um, modifying the policy to establish a process to grant a waiver on an individual project basis, um, the last one, I'll just note because we just handed this out, would be to defer the fee until C of O or final inspection, at which time the fee would be paid. And then an absorption plan for an ownership project would be established. And then as the units were sold, a rebate would be issued based on a pro rata share of the fee. Um, and that rebate would be predicated on um, a quarterly economic analysis that would be done. And um, just a note, we intend to conduct a quarterly economic analysis now of the housing market so that we will, at any given point in time, have an, an up-to-date um, report. Kathy Head with Kaiser Marston, um, who prepared the report that is attached to the staff report, is here to elaborate on her report or to answer any questions on the uh, housing market, economic feasibility, or uh, any way she can um, contribute. And Mr. Garcia has drafted the resolution with all of these right. options. So okay. thank you very tried to provide as much or yeah. many options as we can. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Weaver. Yeah. Just in broad general terms, the state of California mandates that in the San Fernando redevelopment zone that we provide low, low, low affordable housing in that category, right? It mandates By that 15% of the units that are developed must be affordable. Okay. So it w well, for, uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Yes, Weaver, Mr. City Manager. Ju just so we have sort of full disclosure on this issue, uh, and we mentioned this back when the in lieu fee was established, the obligation is on the redevelopment agency as part of its uh, powers of redevelopment. Uh, the agency has the ability through the city housing authority to impose that obligation on developments that take place. In the absence of an in lieu fee or obligating the developers to provide the units, the housing authority uh, redevelopment agency then through the housing authority has the obligation to meet the inclusionary housing requirements. That, you can do that either inside or outside the project area. If outside, it has to be on the basis of two units for every one unit that's required. That's what I was getting at. In lieu fee, if we, if we went to zero, for instance, right. then all the onus is on the redevelopment agency to build that affordable housing. That's right. Either in or, or out. Right. And what timeline are we under? If a structure goes in and say it's in two years, how long after that do we have before we have to to build that affordable housing either in or outside the uh, zone? Kathy Head, our resident expert, probably knows that. How are you? Good afternoon, all of the various bodies. I'm just going to refer to you as the council, except for the two housing authority members. You have a 10-year window. So in every 10-year cycle, you have to make sure that you meet that 15% test. And then it just accumulates over time till the end of the project area. Okay. I'm just going to leave this up here. One, one other little detail, Kathy, while you're there. If there is actually redevelopment assistance or housing assistance to a project, the percentage is? It's actually still 15%. 15. It's only if the agency or the housing authority actually went and constructed units. Then it's 30%. So the age, then it's 30%, then it's 30%. of which half have to be very low income. All right. Thank you. Mr. Yusefian. 
Kathy, come back. Hang <laughs> out here for a while. Yeah. Uh, the exhibit two that is given to us revised. Uh, it gives the address of several uh, affordable housing projects that we have, uh, that agency has built on that site. Uh, 1855 South Brand, Mira Loma, San Fernando, and Dorn Platts. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, just Dorn Platts is a market rate housing, so it does not count. The number of units that is uh, put out there is as 116. So basically, 116 units are affordable, very low or low mod that has been built in the redevelopment agency. Now, under the state, that leverages out to 776 units. Mm -hmm. So my understanding of this chart is that currently on San Fernando Corridor, which is a new agency, mm -hmm. I think it has another, what, 20 years, 25 years life in 12 years, it took 12 years to get the zoning passed, so it's a 30 year. When's the 2035? 2035. 2035, so, you know, yeah. it's almost there. <laughs> uh, so, let's say 30 years. So, today, if I take this in that time capsule, mm -hmm. if I build 776 units tomorrow, mm -hmm. I meet my obligation. Actually, what you have to keep in mind is you already have 197 because all the units actually create both an obligation and then some can fulfill that obligation. Mm -hmm. So the affordable units trigger their own obligation. Right. In counterintuitive, though, that and might that's, see. And that's what the number is down to 116. Correct. And so what would happen is, well, the way I would look at it, and it's the first time I'm seeing this chart, so I'm doing it on the fly a bit, is you'd have, you have 200 units that have been constructed mm -hmm. in the redevelopment project area. You have 116 that fulfill that obligation. What that effectively means is you've got plus or minus 576 units left you could build before triggering another obligation on yourself. Uh, that's not what I read it. Okay, let me get my copy. Go ahead. Tell me what you think. I think, um, no, uh, I think what you said is, is correct. The I think the chart is showing me that correct. I have, because some of them we have required... Them to replace them because we tore down buildings to build right. them and so out of 197 that is built actually by replacing everything and doing all of the, the, the mathematics what you end up having is in your bank basically you have 116 left in your bank this is what oh, you I have it's saying. unencumbered yes. it's not it's not so if you take that and you say this is going to be my 15 percent mm -hmm which means 85% right. will be the 776. You're absolutely correct. Okay. In these numbers also, staff does not include the 77, 72 units? That's not correct. There because, because we have not gotten funded yet, right. so we don't know. So basically... And can I just if, make one clarification? If I build then? 800, I have a problem. Right. Well, and what I would say is the thing you have to keep in mind, too, is each time you build one of those units, it triggers. Right. So we just have to keep in mind that, that yes and no question. But, but plus or minus, you're absolutely correct. Right. Okay. So that's one thing I wanted to know. So currently, so we comply today. We actually, right. because that's right. the only thing we have built on San Fernando Corridor. Correct. There's nothing else, just affordable. Correct. Uh, by the way, the 12 unit or the 24 unit on San Fernando for paraplegics, that's not in here. That, that's correct. Anne, Anne just gave me a piece of paper, and I'm going to ask her to explain where 6200 San Fernando Road um, fits in. We had to replace the units at, at uh, 6200 San Fernando Road because we took down. Right. Um, but those were all affordable units. Because 6200 San Fernando is not yet under construction, we didn't include it in this chart. Okay. But if you do include it, you would have 135 available units where it says total units it would be 135 instead of 116 correct and that would be 906 okay. supportable okay okay i see that all right uh the other question i have is from staff on exhibit one uh on exhibit one it's right after the motion uh there is a list of all the housing projects that are supposedly going to be built uh one is 47 units uh, one is 54 units, 
The other one is the Alliance 204 units and Equity Residential 218. Uh, now, I understand the, the ones on top because some have entitlement, some are in the process of entitlement. I know one that is not going to build. Uh, who assumed that there's going to be on 10, 15 grand view, there's going to be 300 units? I mean, the zone, uh, that's, they're not even applying for that. Their number was much lower than that. Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of, of the right. uh, City Council, uh, this was their original proposal. Right. Um, and, and it may have been just a, a lack of communication between our two departments. You're correct, though. Their, their proposal was reduced to 225, and that it would become back before you. Even that requires... And no reduction. guarantees that they will no get that. But uh, the reason I, I this shows the worst case. Right, the reason I brought that up is uh, <coughs> because in the calculations, in Luffy calculations, it's probably going to be picked up which did picked up in the paper that, gee, there's a possibility of the $12 million. In reality, that $12 million is a phantom $20, $12 million. It doesn't exist because 3.8 million of it is for this 300 unit that doesn't exist. We have no clue what that will be uh, if it ever happens. The rest of them are the real numbers that are actually in the process, and if it happens, those are the numbers that we'll be looking at. So those are the clarifications I wanted, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Safe and Cherry Safe. And then did you get the cumulative totals you're after also? Yes. Okay. It's about $9 million, now $12 million. Thank you. All right. Uh, if there are no other comments, let's go to the public. Good. Uh, our first speaker is Rodney Kahn, followed by um, Albert Karamanukian. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, uh, City Council members, Housing Authority members, and City staff. My name is Rodney Kahn. I'm here primarily today to speak on behalf of Dr. Karmanukian and on 1838 South Brand, which is his project. We actually started working on this project back in 2005. So you could imagine that the, uh, the times were very different. The real estate market was strong. Uh, construction financing was easy to obtain. Uh, overall, uh, the economy was in much better shape than we are here today. So we fast forward to today, and we're looking at some different actions and different uh, ideas to talk about as it relates specifically to this NLU fee. Now, I had a chance to review the staff report. I looked quickly at these different uh, actions. I haven't really analyzed the last one, which is eight. But as it relates to what I've seen so far, um, it looks like option or action number six, which is to modify the NLU fee policy to establish a process for granting reductions or waivers of the inclusionary housing NLU fee based upon a finding that the fee makes the development economically infeasible and consider granting a waiver or reduction for an individual project is the action item that we would like to see uh, adopted, uh, discussed, uh, what we would like to see uh, for the project that I'm here to speak about. We know this is a policy decision. We know that we're not just here for one project. But what I also know is, is based on this list and also the clarification that Mr. Yousefian just went through in terms of the potential projects or the projects that have been identified, the reality is, is many of those projects that were identified will not be built. In terms of the market rate projects will not be built. What we know, what has been built in this area is a number of affordable housing projects. So how can we today in this climate and in this economy get market rate projects to be built in this San Fernando Road corridor. Dr. Karmanukian is going to speak after myself. He has some ideas for his project that he would like to suggest and recommend uh, to the staff and to the, the council for what he's looking at doing. I have to tell you something. I'm familiar with uh, developing property. 
I'm familiar with the San Fernando Road corridor. Uh, I would not, first of all, I could not obtain the financing today for ownership condominium project. Also, I would not be willing to take the risk of developing property in this area. So I would congratulate and, and welcome people that are willing to do that and have us find a way or try a way to help them to be able to do that. Conclude my remarks. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Mr. Kahn. Question? <clears throat> yes. Oh, Mr. Kahn. Mr. Khan, um, if we were to follow the uh, recommendation in number six, um, that you're uh, proposing, would you also advise equity residential proposals of 218 units to also seek a waiver? Uh, you have some connection with them as well. Sure. Council Member Nijarian. We, I and the point not to put you on the spot, and you don't have to answer that. Sure. It's more of a rhetorical question. But don't you think that this would create a, a, a uh, slippery slope where everyone else in line would follow right in and say, well, you've, we've set a precedent in doing this? Mr. Nijarian, there's always that possibility. I look at this more as on a case-by-case -case basis. If someone could make that argument and someone could show you the, ne the economics and the numbers for you to support that project, I would encourage you to support that project as well. Here, right here. Okay. And Mr. Weaver. So, Mr. Conn, if we did a reduction in the in lieu fee or eliminated it, who's going to build the affordable housing then? Who's going to build the affordable housing? Mr. Weaver, so far what I've heard uh, stated, at least as clarified, was that currently you have a number of affordable housing units that, that exist that would fulfill the requirements as they are currently proposed. For now, but. For now. But I, ultimately, who would have to pay? Well, I think ultimately, I, I don't think that this is something that you're adopting and saying in this economy and in this climate, this is the way it's going to be from this point on. I think you revisit this on a regular basis. And when you do revisit this on a regular basis, if things have changed, your policies will also change. You're saying if we approve certain ones today, they get away scot-free, just like it was before we even started down this path a few years ago. Right? Thank you. <laughs> it's okay, Mr. Conn. I put you that's, on the If that's your interpretation you of what I said, I don't know what to say to that. But okay. <laughs> Before the state got involved, you know. Sure. All right. Uh, do we have any other questions, Mr. Kahn, before we move on? No. Oh, oh. Yes, we do. I gave you a list. You saw the list on Exhibit 1. I, I think some of them you worked for to entitle some of those projects. Yes. Okay. Uh, do you know what the status is on 525? And uh, do you know what the status is on, uh, uh, I mean, is equity residential going to build? Uh, Mr. Yosefian, or I should say Council Member Yosefian, uh, first of all, in terms of 525 West Elk Avenue, the 54 unit, in all likelihood that will not be built. That has not been submitted for plan check. That has not been designed according to the new building code. Mm -hmm. So the likelihood is that is not going to be moving forward. Uh, as it relates to equity residential, yes, that is going to be moving forward. That is a project that's very real that is moving forward and that hopefully will be in front of you for final approval in the next few months. Is that a rental or ownership? Equity residential is a rental. Is a rental? Yes. Okay. Um, you had nothing to do with Alliance? No, I did not. Okay. And so maybe somebody can answer that question, what's happening with Alliance? I think... Uh, Mr. Lanzafane may be able to answer that. Well, he, he, he was representing them before. Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilman Yusefian, uh, they are in plan check. They hope to be out of plan check. Alliance? Uh, Alliance. It says this is plan check project. will expire on 10-08. Um, they have some of the plans. They're looking for final plan check. Their financing is dependent on being permit ready. All of their plans permit ready. Mm -hmm. They think that they would be able to do that within 45 to 60 days. Complete their plan check and then confirm their financing. That They're in the same boat, though. Everybody else is... Um, financing, yes. Chasing after limited dollars. Was this, refresh my memory, was this a rental or it was a condo? It was, or a, 
it was initially proposed as a condominium, but with the market going the way it was, they came in in their final uh, design and asked to make it rental. Okay. And so it is being right. planned, uh, checked as a rental. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lenz. And Mr. City Manager, you had your hand up. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members, uh, just to point out that most of these projects that will be coming in as rental, with maybe the exception of equity, will be doing maps on them. So at some point, if the housing market rebounds, they have the option of coming in and converting which I suspect you'd see and is also a strategy that Ms. Head points out in, in her analysis uh, can be a strategy used by those who were planning for sale and want to proceed, but do it initially as, as rental. Uh, second point, uh, just a reminder, it's in the staff report, but to continue to point out that uh, under the Kaiser Marston evaluation, for rental is feasible at this point to build, even based on land values that might have been in effect two years ago, it's for sale because of that nature of that, uh, that that is not feasible even with relief on the fee but uh, we'd suggest if you're looking at waivers it would be for for sale units not not rental units yes but uh, I'm going to go to you in just a second Mr. Weaver but I do want to say we're going to go back to our our normal uh, procedure here which is we'll hear the rest of the speakers and then we'll ask our questions and so on afterward but let me go to you Mr. Follow up on that's that. quite all right go right ahead um, I think the report also said you could build them as apartments later to make uh, conversions to condos, correct? So build them to the standards of uh, condos or whatever. Is that true? Uh, that, that's correct. The report points that out. It struck me, though, and, and uh, maybe Kathy Head can comment on it after the uh, oral communications is done, that there is a cost associated with that conversion, depending on how long they've been rental units. Uh, you probably have to go in and do some rehab of the units in order to get them uh, able to, able to sell. So there'd probably be some additional costs associated with the conversion. I don't know if that's factored into the report analysis or not, but so I know there, there'd be something there. All right. Let's hear the rest of our speakers. We have Albert Karamanukian, followed by Murad Topalian. Mr. Mayor, City Council members, City Manager, City Attorneys. My name is Karam Anugin. I reside in the city of Glendale 30 years. Since uh, 30 years, uh, I had many businesses as a physician, as a businessman, and developed. My first development, I started in 1982 in 722 East Lomita. The last one, I just finished on uh, uh, Central as a medical building and a townhouse. Uh, we started uh, to design this 47 unit 1838 South Brand Boulevard. Uh, and at that time, as everybody knows, uh, the economy was good and uh, we got forward to uh, change that area. But today, as everybody knows, economies change and uh, prices of the construction and also the financing, it's approximately impossible. Uh, they mentioned that uh, there are 200 something unit alliances and they have some difficulty of financing. When they have the financing, I would like to see in my eyes, then I believe they're going to have financing to build that. But today, I, uh, I did many risks in my life. You know, I did many uh, uh, projects, but this one, it's going to be very difficult if I don't have some help and to, to waive this and low fee. It's going to be very difficult. As we said in that area, uh, San Fernando Corridor, we already has a project for 249 affordable housing total next to this project. It's 65 units, 44 units, 72 units, 68 units. And uh, if you see uh, about six months ago when we start to find difficulty of financing, uh, we came uh, and we met with the city manager, Mr. Starbert, and we discussed, and he asked us to uh, present performa, which we did. You have the performa. I think each one of you reviewed this performa. And in this performa, you will see even within lieu fee, we, I lose money. But as I told you, I'm a person who take risk, but calculated risk, I would like to take that one. And I, my, uh, uh, the plan is ready to pull the permit. Without your help, I don't think I can afford. Uh, I will show you, show you the project here. Um, Dr. Dr. Karmanukin, if you need to be at the microphone when you're speaking. Or, or please take this uh, portable mic and then you can roam about the cabin if you wish. Okay. Presently, you have this project that we have here. 
In the future, you're going to have this in that area. There's a difference. It's going to be in that area. And I'm the first one that I have the permit ready to pull, and I'm willing to start the construction if I have a Louis V to waive. I know there's other people maybe will ask, but the economy. Economy today, it doesn't support any project if there is this kind of and in the performance that I presented to you, the construction fee here is less expensive than in 72 units they presented to you with $38 million. It's 100000 per each unit less. Even with that less construction fee, I, you have a loss here if, you, if I don't get a waiver of new fee. Thank you to give me opportunity. I hope, you know, uh, as I told you, I've been in the city of Glendale for 30 years. Uh, still, I'm doing de development and business. I have three businesses. I have 68 employees at present time. I serve 280 other elderly people and also city members and know my contribution to the city of Glendale for 30 years. And I'm the major supporter for community center that we are building on Chestnut. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kermanuk. Mr. Mayor, okay. you suggested we wait until after? Yes, there's only a couple. Thank you. Two more speakers. So I have a question from him okay. later. Okay. Uh, Murad Topalian, followed by Nancy Kent. And, that, and Nancy is our last speaker, and then we'll get back to uh, questions and comments. Mr. Okay. Chairman, members of council, staff, uh, really the previous two speakers covered the issue rather well. I have no horse in this race. I'm not a builder. I'm not a consultant. I'm not paid for anything. I know Dr. Manugian uh, from his activities in the community and his development in the community. I've been impressed because he puts his money where his mouth is. When we talked about helping youth and development, he put over $300,000 from, from his pocket into building a youth center for the community in the low-income area. He's helped with the senior citizens. Uh, he's put himself out on the line. My concern here is that this project was started in 2005. Building costs, as you know, have gone up ridiculously in the last three years. Nobody is building anything new. This man is willing to take a risk if we help him. I encourage council to consider a way to find a method in your personal genius, in your collective wisdom, to help the community. Because I think having all the low-income housing going in on San Fernando, I think, is a detriment to the community. You need mixed housing, mixed housing to help the whole area. If you put all the low-income housing or the majority, majority of it in one area, I can assume certain things will happen just because they've happened in so many other cities. When you accumulate people that are struggling or trying to get by uh, all in one area. So mixed housing, I think, is a good thing for the city in that area. And I would encourage you to consider it and consider that you have a man willing to take a risk on our community, on his own, where everyone else is standing on the sideline and waiting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pauline. Uh, Nancy Kent. Nancy Kent, resident of Glendale. Building affordable housing is a good thing. State law requires 15% of the new housing and redevelopment areas to be affordable. If the developer does not build or, or pay an in-lieu fee for these affordable units, taxpayers do. If Glendale's housing authority is not able to secure grant money, the money to build them, I believe, would ultimately have to come from our general fund. And please correct me if I'm wrong on that. The 2008 analysis done by Kaiser Marston for the city of Glendale said the estimated cost of building these units is $35 per square foot. The Glendale City Council has set the fee developers pay not at $35, but at $17 per square foot. The document from the developer of 1838 South Brand showed that this $926,000 in lieu fee will wipe out all of the profit expected for these 
47 market rate condos. Financing construction is hard right now, but I want to shine a light on the fact that if the City Council decides to grant this request to waive this fee, it will set a precedent. The staff report says the Council should establish criteria to grant future reductions or waivers. <laughs> Development can be very profitable, but it's also a highly risky investment. The staff report says the criteria for future reductions or waivers could include that it's, quote, necessary to make the project economically feasible, end quote. I realize this in Luffy is completely different from a variance, but I'm used to hearing that economic hardship for a developer is not a valid finding for land use decisions. Waiving this fee is not really a land use decision. It's a public subsidy to a private developer. Some people call this corporate socialism. All the profit goes to the private company, but taxpayers are forced to chip in to help out private companies. That is our system of government in America. The staff report mentions the possibility of reducing this fee for all future projects. $17 is already less than half of what the units actually cost, so decreasing it would be a greater public subsidy for private developers. The staff report also mentions doing an annual adjustment to the in-lieu fee. The city hired Kaiser Marston in 2004, 2006, and 2008 to analyze residential building costs in Glendale. I hope an annual adjustment would save the city the money it's been paying to Kaiser Marston. However, it was suggested to base the adjustment on the price of housing in Los Angeles County, which is currently going down. Isn't it more reasonable to taxpayers to tie it to the cost of constructing new units since that's what the fee is used for? Waiving this fee today is like giving this developer approximately $1 million of taxpayer money. If the city of Glendale has extra money, is subsidizing private developers the best way to spend it? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kent. All right. I thank all the speakers. I'm sure there will be some questions for some, and I'm Gazing over, I see that my Garcia is sufficiently revived and uh, and also at the ready. Okay. Uh, Council Member Yusefian had his hand up before. I had a question uh, from Mr. Mnookin, Karo Mnookin. Uh, going over your uh, uh, Exhibit 4, which is your uh, performa, it says building fees and permits, $580,000. Uh, I'm assuming this includes your park fee? Park fee and, and how much? Fee. And how much is your park fee? Two thousand dollar per unit. And that's because you were entitled. Uh, you were one of those projects that was the, in the pipeline. The channel. Yes. Okay, so that's almost close to a hundred thousand dollars. Yes. That includes in that five yes. eight. Okay. Thank you. Thank that you. was a question I had. Uh, one other comment uh, uh, to Mrs. Kent. Mr. Mayor, uh, we do not spend money from general fund for housing. Housing money generally comes from the 20% set aside that is from redevelopment agencies uh, money. And then uh, the rest of the money comes from uh, home funds, and uh, which is the federal money that they provide. So we, Mr. Manager, have we ever spent any money from the general fund? Well, ever is a long time. In the time I've been here, we haven't spent general fund money. It's been about 10 years. Matt has been here, here longer than you. I've been here longer. He's been here forever. Not to my knowledge. <laughs> I would also point Thank out you. that forever is usually shorter than some of our joint meetings. So, <laughs> so you know, but, but she had a good question, and, and I think there's a lot of people who don't know this. So I think that was a good question to ask. gives us an opportunity to answer that question. Uh, so those are the questions I had, and I think the clarification, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Yusuf. And Mr. Weaver. I'd like clarification on option eight. Exactly what is it saying? I've read it, but would you repeat since you just gave it to us? Sure. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council, members of the authority of the agency, essentially option eight uh, is to defer the fee um, until certificate of occupancy. Right, right now it's currently required to be collected at the time of building permit. Uh, defer it until uh, the certificate of occupancy is, is going to be issued. Um, and then it would uh, allow for a rebate of that in lieu fee for ownership housing uh, to the extent they sell the units uh, within a certain absorption period, which equals amount uh, basically four units per month. So for a project that was 48 units, that'd be if all the units would have to be sold within a year to get that um, 
the entire uh, in lieu fee rebate, and that's only to the extent that the quarterly analysis that Ms. Blake mentioned shows that a uh, in lieu fee for ownership projects is, is still not feasible. So that's essentially how it would mechanically so how it would work. No matter what in lieu fee we establish, whether it's thirty five, seventeen, or whatever amount. Correct. I think the. Then the the op Mr. Weaver, the option that's presented is assuming that the fee will still be $17 per square foot, um, and then it would, it, rather than being required to be collected at the time of building permit, it would be deferred until CFO, and then for an ownership project, um, they would pay the fee at the CFO, but they would be entitled to a rebate on a pro rata basis as they sell each unit, assuming that the quarterly analysis that uh, KMA is going to prepare continues to show that there is infeasibility in paying that fee for an ownership project. Is there any way to put numbers to that at all? I mean, we know if it goes to zero, paying everything, if we say we went with option eight, are we, and it's $17, I mean, we likely still be back right where we're with a zero in lieu fee or what? No, that's actually an excellent question. We were we were writing number eight as I was driving here from Huntington Beach. So um, there are nuances to that. The notion is, the basic notion which we're trying to get to with that option is that if there's a policy matter, you would like to encourage ownership housing in the community when ownership housing is marginal to not marketable. One way to encourage that is to eliminate the in lieu fee. Given the analysis right now looks that rental housing works, is to say, okay, well, if you're going to build and rent, you're going to pay the fee. You'll pay it at completion, but you'll pay the fee. If you're going to build and sell units when it's really marginal to do that, we're the city going to give you a break. Now, the way we viewed it was then that whole fee would be rebated because right now our analysis indicates that even if you rebate the entire fee, it's still not feasible. If we got into that nuanced point where a $15 fee was feasible, then I think that would be another item we have to consider on how we how we rebate that fee. Right. Well, we could, I mean, we already have the option to lower the fee, um, and then they could add that, or right. basically combine options and have a, have a lower fee as well as a part right. of rebate. Uh, Mr. Weaver, did you get your answer? That I had one other question. Let's do that, and then we'll go to Council Member Quintero. The statement was made that we put a lot of affordable housing in that area already. The doctor is contemplating. Does it make any logical sense to have it more distribution? In other words, not force the affordable issue here and put it somewhere else. Is there any argument? If you understand what I'm saying, and Mr. City Manager. Well, if if he pays his in lieu, it will go someplace else. I mean, you'll have some projects somewhere that the in lieu will go right. towards supporting. It could be in this area. It could be someplace else in the project area. It could be someplace else in the city. Right. Uh, so by paying in lieu, it's not going to happen in this project. It's going to happen someplace outside of the project. Okay. Out, out, of, out of that development. It could right. happen next right. door, or right. it could happen all the way on right. the other side of town. All right. Mr. Quintero. I have a question <clears throat> on number eight. Um, what criteria would you use, say, two years from now to establish whether... Uh, what we were planning to do, or our proposal is, to do that simple adjustment that w that's in several of the other options, which is say, let's look at how home prices have changed. So then rather than, um, as Mrs. Kent said, doing a big study every couple of years, and just in full disclosure, I just did this one. I didn't do the other two. So you should have driven in from Laguna, then you would have. Then I could have done the other two, but I, I was only coming from. Money. Or drive around the block a few times. Right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. So is what we were trying to do, and this was we started doing this. I worked on the Pasadena ordinance, and we started this one in 2001 when we did that in the really rapidly rising prices of the early 2000s. In lieu fees were constantly falling behind. And so what we did is we did this automatic adjuster based on home prices. Well, in the same way, when they fall, we would take it down, the fee down by that same percentage. Okay. And it's, it takes about a half hour to do that as opposed to the four-block right. study. I understand that. However, you're going to be looking at L.A. County or right. you're going to be looking at this specific market. Now, the problem is with the data is you can only get it for L.A. County. So I would still suggest that every three or five years you actually do a study. 
but just as a means of keeping up with, with some semblance of the market. You can't break the data down by zip codes? Or... You know, you can, but then what happens is you've got to make sure you get enough data. Because everybody's using data quick. It was the foundation of your other analysis, foundation of my analysis. It's foundation of the real estate research data. But if in some periods, you end up with four sales, and in some periods, you end up with 100 sales. I guess what I'm thinking in terms of the criteria, mm -hmm. using the San Fernando Road corridor and looking at those uh, projects and sales and so forth along the corridor right into the southern portion of the uh, city. We wouldn't be comparing Stalker. We wouldn't of be course. comparing Dryden. We'd be comparing the... Uh, the southern portion and we the did that. We did that when we were doing this analysis. We looked at the San Fernando corridor. We looked at that, that kind of comparables. The other problem you run into with comparables is they tend to run, because of the recording data coming out and being published, they tend to run about six months behind. And so that's another constraint in a either rapidly growing or rapidly decreasing market. So none of it's perfect. Absolutely. Okay. Let me... Just one second, Mr. City Manager. Let me just ask Mr. Jarian and uh, Ms. Prazia and Ms. Minsky if they have any questions for Kathy. the current speaker at the podium. I Thank don't, you. but it's nice to see you again. Nice to see you, too. I, I don't too. Okay. Them. Let me go to the City Manager quickly, and then let's go to that. Just, just one quick follow-up on the conversation uh, about option number eight. I think more important than whatever mechanism you use for some future adjustment is this mechanism gives you a way to make sure that when a developer comes to you and says, uh, I want to do for sale housing, and I need the waiver to do for sale housing, that you actually make sure that the for sale housing is built and sold, as opposed to giving the waiver, and then two years down the road when it finally gets built, he puts a map on it and rents a bunch of them for a while. The market comes back and he eventually sells them as condos, but they don't come out of the chute as condos and for sale. If the waiver is justified to induce for sale housing, you have a mechanism to make sure that's actually going to occur in the two years it may take to actually get the plans through and actually get it built. This would do that. Uh, and I think that aspect of this is more important than whatever mechanism we set up to figure out what will happen to future rates uh, the next go around. Okay. Council Member Nijarin. I have a question for Ms. Head. Um, the, the adjustment, let's say were we to uh, have a project before us today mm -hmm. with the option eight scenario, mm -hmm. uh, your analysis shows an 18% reduction from? If you just wanted to do a straight reduction based on home price change in the last year, you would do an 18% reduction to the $17. Okay. It's one of the many options. And and that is calculated regardless of how efficiently or how inefficiently the particular developer builds his unit. That is correct. Uh, so you're looking at the market in general and any increase or decrease in sales prices um, and indexed, I'm sure, at, at some level. New home sales prices? It's the new home sales prices. And this is done in Pasadena? It's done in Pasadena, and now it's done in Huntington Beach, where I just was before I was here. Mm -hmm. And if the project, so the, the fees are paid at the time of the certificate of occupancy? They are. Rebated at the time of sale? Don't do rebates anywhere else. I'm sorry. This rebate is a specific Glendale example. The change in the fee base and the change in the new home price is in a number of ordinances, um, okay. largely that I've so worked on. This is, has just a little twist to it. Correct. Essentially, it's affecting the same benefit to, to the developer if, if in fact, the home market is down. Exactly. And if, as, as Mr. Starbird mentioned, if they then build and sell. No, build and sell. And what if they build and rent? Build and rent, the idea would be they would pay the fee. Because right now, given the returns in the rental market, the rental market supports the fee. It's the ownership that doesn't. And so if the policy matter is that you're trying to encourage ownership housing, this creates an incentive for somebody to build and sell rather than build and rent. So that becomes your policy decision. All right. Not of Ms. Head, but of Ms. Blake. Um, what is the whole rationale behind putting the burden on a developer to include 15% affordable housing when the benefits to a redevelopment zone are a are inured to the city or the redevelopment agency itself. A developer who buys a piece of land there doesn't get any bonus because it's in the redevelopment zone, yet we're, we're uh, saddling him with the, uh, the burden of 15% or an in-lieu fee. Is there something 
some policy issue that I'm missing because I, I'm not really clear on that. I think Mr. Starbird wants to answer that question. Well, that was a nice toss, Mel. <laughs> well, no, I will answer it, but you, you put your button I on think, it. Yeah. <laughs> Kathy will probably have some comments on this, too. But, but there is a benefit to property owners in a redevelopment project area, and that is that you're plowing your tax increment dollars back into investment in the area. And, and that's why the state saw fit to burden redevelopment agencies with this additional obligation of addressing affordable housing. That's why you set aside your 20%. That's why you have a specific obligation if through your redevelopment efforts, and that doesn't mean specifically supporting a project, but by your general efforts in a redevelopment area, you improve property values. And by improving property values comes a burden. Property owners benefit by it, developers benefit by it, and you have to carry an additional burden of making sure that affordable housing is being addressed. For example, our landscaping, exactly. the lighting, exactly. everything that we're doing on San Fernando. Well, and frankly, you imparted a tremendous amount of value when, when you went through your rezone of this area and allowed people to have an opportunity to do housing in areas that were previously commercial and industrial. That significantly increased property values. Uh, and this says, you know what, not only the agency and the housing authority have to work at reinvesting, but the people who benefit from those values should be also putting something back into those project areas and addressing affordable housing. All right, why don't you toss it right back to Madeline Blake because <laughs> she's... She one, one small point. Um, what, as we were brainstorming, one of the, the thoughts behind the um, option eight is one of the issues is developers tight on funding and financing at this point. And so the idea was defer this particular fee until after construction is completed. Okay. All right. Um, I have one. Where, did you have any other questions? No. Mr. Mincy? No. Ms. Browse. I, I had a question and I got my answer. Okay. So it was about having the conversion later on uh, from the rental to condominium. Okay. I got my answer. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Right. I have one quick question for you. Um, Ms. Head, the pro forma that uh, Dr. Karmanukian has presented, mm -hmm. you've looked at that. I have. And you've also run your own numbers. I have. Okay. He appears on his uh, pro forma to be somewhat uh, underwater on this. Correct. Do your numbers, when you look at it, uh, jibe at just how far underwater he would be? Yes. They do. Okay. All right. Thank you. That was my only question to you. Um, let me see here. I would just comment to uh, Mr. Topalian that said he would leave it to our our genius up here let's not ask for the impossible today let us, let us just stick with the facts <laughs> thank you hard cards that we've been dealt yes we'll play the cards we've been dealt thank you okay uh, council member quintero there aren't any other questions um, i'll begin for many many years the city of Glendale, the redevelopment agency, has talked about housing on San Fernando Road. We specifically rezoned with the idea of mixed use and, and so forth. I specifically am interested in the southern portion of the redevelopment zone. I'm not interested in housing sort of to the north, if you want to call it that. I'm interested in this particular section of the redevelopment zone because of the transportation center. We've got Amtrak there, we've got the MTA, we have our own bus lines, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the ideal uh, area in Glendale to have apartments, to have uh, condominiums, et cetera. Well, we haven't been able to, or let's say the private sector has not been able to build any condominiums to date in the uh, in the bubble that we all experienced uh, in the past few years, there were numerous projects and numerous developers that talked about this and talked about that. One developer was going to put housing right on the railroad tracks, which I thought to myself, boy, that's going to take some gritty homeowners to want to, it's going to take a different type of person to want to, they even had some, uh, they got some advice from developers in Chicago that they were talking to about how to build next to uh, railroad tracks. But anyway, we built some excellent affordable housing projects in this uh, zone. Now I think we're ready for the next step, which is to build condominiums, private sector development, to have people who will put down their down payments and live in those uh, units. 
So overall, in terms of a concept, I think that that number eight idea is probably an excellent, uh, an excellent way to go. I think that uh, that will enable a developer to come in, build the units, and hopefully be able to uh, sell them. If the developer can't sell them, then he'll rent them, and that'll be the uh, end of it. But I think both the taxpayers are protected, and in a sense, the uh, developer is protected. But I want to get back to the overall goal, and that's to have high-end market rate condominiums in this section of Glendale. And uh, I am for it. I think this is uh, a good idea. We have built lots of affordable housing there. I'm not going to go for another project in this area that's an affordable housing project, by the way. I think we've, we've done enough in this area to encourage, uh, to encourage housing. So I hope we come up with a uh, solution. And if we keep our fingers crossed, maybe in a couple of years, the market will uh, turn. And in fact, we'll have, uh, we'll have market rate housing in this particular part of, uh, of the city, and I think we'll all be the better for it. So that's the way I see this, this issue. Thank you, Mr. Guntera. Ms. Prosy, do you have anything? No, thank you. Okay. Mr. Weaver? Well, I concur with Mr. Guntera. I like option eight. I, I don't know if at the time we do it, how these two motions, how we do do Fortunately, we, we have a, we have a, an attorney legal, sitting legal, yes. over yonder who will guide us through so that. So we would be doing 1A and B would not if we adopt like option 8. Right. If you go with 1 with the resolution with option 8, you would not need to adopt the motion. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Najarian. Um, I, too, like option 8. Um, well, first I want to want to get out in the open that uh, I uh, have received a campaign contribution from Mr. Kermanukian uh, five months ago in the amount of $500. And uh, if any of my colleagues object or in any way question my impartiality, I'll be happy to recuse myself. Seeing no hands going up, I'm going to continue with my comments. I agree with Mr. Quintero's uh, analysis that we do need market rate housing in that area. The, the uh, trouble is in our current system is the risk, the risk that the housing market may uh, take a further dive, uh, putting the developers' uh, funds at risk, and the risk for the city should the market uh, rebound uh, quite handsomely and uh, the city lose out of in lieu fees that they otherwise could have obtained. So Section 8, which uh, essentially uh, encourages and ensures that the property is built and sold as uh, ownership units and the analysis essentially at the point of sale as uh, as to the market conditions uh, largely minimizes the risk to the developer and uh, I am uh, I also would support option eight for those reasons that I just gave and given previously by my colleagues. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Najarian. Mr. Yusekin. Okay. Um, having built homes, not apartments or condos, so what happens when you are building and you're in a project? Generally, by the time you're finished with the project, you're out of money. So you don't have half a million dollars hanging out there or a million dollars hanging out there. The issue that I have with option eight is that right after you finish with a project, especially this one, which is showing about a $1.45 million loss, and his in lieu is only 925000 which means even if you don't charge him for the in lieu, he's still going to be half a million dollars in a hole. So he still has to come up with that half a million dollars and he hasn't made one cent yet. And right after he gets his occupancy permit, in order to get his occupancy permit so he could sell it, he has to come up with another million dollars, basically 900 and some odd thousand dollars. And then after he sells those units, he can get them back. Chances are 
this won't be built. Because if you are a developer, if you built anything, I don't care who you are, if, it's, if you're building just a house, you're a homeowner, there's no way after a remodel you have spent all your money, you bought everything, there's nothing left in the end. So you're not going to go out there and spend another $20,000 because you just spend it on the sub-zero refrigerator and it's gone. <laughs> I'll tell you what the realistic thing is, and I think if there's a way to craft this, this is, this is how it's going to work. The realistic thing is, this is going to take about two years to build, 18 months to two years to build. After this picture is finished, almost everyone who is worth their, you know, mind or soul, or whatever, or soul, how do you say that, that word, uh, in economy tells you, it's going to take us between two to three years to climb out of this. It's going to take at least eight months or so before banks realize what is it they want to do and how they want to loan money. So it will take about three years before we see real estate starting to stabilize and forget about going up, just stabilize, which means this project will be pretty much done and be out there for at least six months to eight months with the market being at the level it is. So what's going to happen is nobody, he's not going to sell the units at a loss. What most people who are going to take the risk are going to be the developers who are going to spend the money, put the money out of their pocket, and rent it out for a year or two. They're going to entitle it. They're going to get their subdivision map act done, and it's going to be subdivided. It's the same thing happened in the 80s, same thing happened in the 70s. Hell, I bought one of those condos in the 80s that was built as a condo, subdivided as a condo. I walked in as a renter. I lived there for about two years. Later on, I turned around and I bought my own condo because market went up and the person decided to sell it because it made enough money. By the way, I paid $79,000 in 1980 for a condo. Boy, those days are gone. <laughs> Nevertheless, that's what's going to happen to this project. So my qu question is, 8 says, right after you're finished, you got to put down a million bucks, and as you start selling it, you get the money back. So my question is, is there, in reality, that's not going to happen. So he's going to probably rent it for a year or two until the market comes back. And then he's going to sell it. How can we do this if we really want this building to be built? And that's the, that's the notion. Do we really want it built? If we want to get it built, how do we do this so he's able to finish it, rent it, and when he sells it, he pays us? Is there a way for us to give him a second? And at the time he sells, if he can do the market analysis and shows that he's not making it, then we will say, you know what, we've done the market analysis in three years. Uh, based on the market analysis, uh, you're going to be in a hole for $500,000, so you owe us $400,000. Is that, is that how, can we do that? I mean. Well, you can do it because this is all just policy questions, so you can absolutely do it. If the notion is you're trying to encourage the ownership units today, then that's not what you would do because rental works. So somebody who bought... Right, but rental only for one or two years. Right, as a means of carrying, and then the market, they wouldn't convert until the market worked. Right. So if you assess the fee, then they wouldn't convert until it worked even after the fee was assessed. So you might have a conversion to ownership later. And what if you, well, there is no conversion. I mean, in, in policy, there may be a convert because he's going to build it as a condo right. and, and paper it as a condo. Yes. So, but it will take a couple of years, let's say, after he builds it for the market to come back. Yes. For him to sell it. Yes. If I wanted to collect my money at that point, how do I work out that two-year gap? Well, see, I guess where, I'm, where I lose the logic is the couple years where he's renting it, they're actually making money. It was when they sold it that they weren't making the money. But, but those two years that they're making money, right. 
they'll be barely covering the rest of this since that's why I asked you no, I was your numbers right so oh, he's no, no. already half a million dollars in a hole oh no question no so, question in fact there's every incentive on this project to build it and rent it mm -hmm. get the map everything he said every incentive right to do for that a couple of years and then turn around and sell it correct and now, ultimately we want them to sell it correct and so the way this is structured if you allow them not to pay the fee while they're renting it you haven't encouraged them to sell it you've encouraged them to rent it but he doesn't have the money to pay you I understand I think that's it's it's a very good point in fact Phil had come over at the same time and said where's he gonna get the money well and that's my to, point to pay that so I'm trying to figure out a way that he can do that for a short period and craft a language such as he has to sell it in right. when the market changes and the city manager seems to have well, okay, that, that but before we go to the city manager thanks but <laughs> I'll go away I won't direct your meeting anymore I'm sorry I'll just um, while you're back. contemplating that let me go to uh, well, council in, member instead of a one sure. million dollar upfront fee what can we do to ensure that we get the uh, the money when the properties are when the condos are sold. So, I mean, could there be a uh, bond that uh, he could purchase? Could there be? I mean, what exactly could we do so the person ha doesn't have to come up with a one million dollar fee? Right, now, I, Mr. Starbird. I imagine you could record a lien on the property so that each individual unit closes. There's a specific amount of money that then has to come out of escrow to pay the city. Before it, before any return goes back to the developer again, uh, I would imagine that kind of mechanism is very doable. The question becomes, though, for what period of time? And if, if there's going to be a period of time when he's going to be allowed to rent, then you got to figure out what's that period of time he'll be allowed to rent, and then depending on that period of time, how much rebate are you going to give him? Because as Kathy has pointed out, the longer he rents it, the less justification there is for a rebate. Now it may be if this if this market condition continues for the next five years, God forbid, then you know he may rent them for two years or three years and still never be able to sell them. In which case, as the as the figures point out, it was a very feasible project, including the in lieu payment to do this as a rental project. So the key is to strike that balance between giving a rebate to induce sale units, which is what uh, Dr. Manugian has proposed to do, and then what period of time to allow him to get to a condition where he can then sell them, and then he'll get his rebate. I would think you can work out a lien on a per unit basis if that was your desire. You could, or you could require a letter of credit. Um the, the problem with the lien, it always goes to the value of the property. But I guess if you're not, if you, it only takes effect once you're selling the unit. So that's. Well, I do like the idea of a letter of credit uh, or a lien. But my experience throughout the years has been that when a condominium goes into a rental situation, it is very difficult to turn around and sell those units sort of one by one over a period of time. I mean, the yeah, banks so. are not going to loan on it. Right. Number one, so. When the conversion comes back to condo sales, it sort of tends to come all in one fell swoop. That's been my that's experience we as would, well. That's when we would collect our uh, fee. Well, again, I guess that's where I keep losing the logic because you want to be collecting the fee while they're renting it. As soon as they sell it, I think we can all agree they shouldn't have paid the fee. So you wouldn't be collecting it then. You're all, when we were talking about what our concern was monitoring, so that's why we wanted to collect the fee and then rebate it rather than have the fee paid if the measure isn't met, rather than collecting the fee as they're renting it, say, oh, you're renting it. So we want to collect that fee. That's tougher. That's a tougher city monitoring task than it is to say, okay, as soon as you sell that unit, we're going to rebate this amount of your fee because then clearly it's in the property owner's best interest to come to you and say, I just sold the unit. I mean, I understand everything. It's, and it, clearly it's just policy. So you guys, I just can only help you with the numbers. Okay, thank you. Other comments? Mr. Weaver, Mr. Brazian, Mr. Mincy, Mr. Yusef. Oh, Kathy. Uh, <laughs> to get you a stool on wheels there. Well, the mayor keeps wanting me to sit down. So. No, I, uh, I, haven't, I haven't asked you to uh, sit no, down. No, I know. I just Sorry, <laughs> I, I'm thinking out loud. I'm trying, I'm trying to work this out in my mind. Uh, what if the city carried a second? Mm -hmm. Okay. And said, okay, after you're finished building, as you start selling, we will look at that, and if we're going to carry a second for a million dollars, mm -hmm. and then this way you owe us a million bucks. Mm -hmm. But we're not asking you to pay after you're done. Mm -hmm. 
but as you start selling, we don't do these calculations the way he has written it four months or four right. a year or right. whatever it is. And at that point, we're going to look at that against our loan. Right, and we'll and, and And we will see how much of that loan we're going to forgive and how much of that loan you're going to have to pay. Is there a way to do that? Sure. So there's a way to do that. Sure. So this way he doesn't have to come in right after the signature and pay. Right. But nevertheless, he cannot rent. He has to sell. And it meets all those categories? Yeah, I'm the way I, I think that's an excellent idea. I think what you would do under that scenario is that let's just use the million dollars. Okay. If, if And let's say it was a four-year absorption period by, by okay. the math in, in option eight. If in year four, none of the units have sold, they'll, he'll owe you a million dollars. Okay. If in four years, half of the units have sold, he'll owe you five hundred thousand okay. dollars. And you can measure it that way. So, and and each time a unit sells in that intervening period, it would be like a debt service payment on your loan. This will force him to get it online and sell it as quickly as possible. So this way, he will offset the rule. That's right. And so then, at, at the in, in essence, you're providing the letter of credit. Right. And and so it will, which will make it easier for him to get a loan from the bank right. because it could be like a silent second or something of that nature. Correct. And so then let's continue to use year four. Year four, none of the units are sold. Year four, day one, he owes you a million dollars. Yeah, that could work. Right. Let me... Uh, what does my <laughs> colleagues think about that? Point. Uh, well, uh, 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 only... Excuse me one second. Talk to me. Yes. Uh, I may, uh, just a clarification, just a point, I guess. The only risk is that your... If the market, I guess, even the rental market continues to go down, your lien, your second that's behind the, the construction exactly. lender may not be worth anything that's right. if, the, if the property goes down. That's the only risk that the city would be taking, and we wouldn't get the fee. Okay. So yeah, but what, what happens if it goes down? It's going to be foreclosed by the bank. Right. So the bank will have to sell. Wouldn't the bank have to pay us or our lien wiped out? Wiped out. out. No, we wouldn't be in position. Okay. Um, Dr. Karamanukian, you wanted to make a comment there. How about the price of the condominium become less and not only you can sell it, you're going to sell it with loss just to pay the bank money. How are we going to come with a million dollars? Yes. Well, I, th I think in that condition, the answer is you shouldn't build it. I mean, if the prospect is the market's so weak that by building it, you're not even going to make your payments to the bank, you shouldn't build it as a for sale housing. And that's what we keep coming back to in, in, in Kathy's analysis is in this market, you're in lieu under normal circumstances probably won't provide enough incentive for a, a knowledgeable developer to invest their money and build for sale housing. Right. Um, and that, uh, I agree with you, and I think if no waiver, no building. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Dr. Minnick. All right, um, one, and, and it does raise one of the questions that was asked by uh, Nancy Kent, and that is, in the process of this, all of this discussion, trying to craft a way to, on the one hand, <clears throat> encourage housing in an area that we want to see housing, uh, you know, ownership. On the other hand, we're trying to find a way to to also do our other task, which is to protect the taxpayers here. There, I don't know that there's a way to thread the needle in such a way that there's absolutely no risk to the developer. Not only do I think there's no way to do that, as we're seeing right now, but I don't even think we should be doing that, to be quite honest with you. At some point, the developer, the developer whether it's Dr. Karmanukian or any developer, has to assume some risk. Uh, the, the, rather than the city uh, being a complete safety net there for every conceivable possibility. I don't think that's our, our job here. I think it's quite the opposite. However, um, I haven't had the opportunity, so let me do it now. I would support option A um, in some configuration that has been discussed here. Uh, I am, but I will say I'm, I am not into the idea of the uh, city carrying a second uh, for the reasons that have also been expressed. We would not be in position if anything went wrong with the market. Um, and, and that, I think, is, is, again, in that category of trying to absolve a developer of any possible risk whatsoever. Um, not to mention the fact that then we're going to be down the road debating this over and over and over again 
with, or not necessarily debating it, but dealing with it again as each other project in the future comes along. I want to add one other thing to the mix here, and that is just to remind my colleagues that um, that Dr. Kermanukin is also somewhat under the gun in terms of time. Uh, we're looking at 12 days before this extension runs out. So we also have to, if we're going to go down this road, craft something that is going to be workable within that time frame as well. So uh, let's not also lose sight of that. Uh, but in general, I would support the idea, uh, uh, the, we'll call it the Huntington Beach to Glendale concept of uh, some kind of deferment that was uh, a deferred payment. Um, if it looks like we don't have enough facts to figure that out today, what are our options, Mr. City Manager and Mr. City Attorney? Well, you have two parties who would have to be in agreement, uh, the developer uh, as well as as well as you all. I think you can give us some guidance, and we can sit down and try and hammer out an agreement with authorization to the city manager to execute, provided it meets whatever particular parameters you set for us. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor? Uh, just one second. I'd like to get the answer to my question first entirely. Well, yes, I would, I would just agree, Mr. Mayor, but add that we we definitely need some clear direction on if mm -hmm. you're going to go with option eight, if there, if there are sort of any additional factors that you want us to include, Beyond what's in what's in the draft resolution now, as what's been discussed, it needs to be clear enough so that there is the authority to to grant the uh, either a waiver if that's the route the council wants to go, or to grant um, this sort of a, a deferral with an option to pay to get rebates. It has to be very clear in the resolution. All right. Yes, uh, Councilmember Quintero, then Councilmember Weaver. Well, I would recommend the uh, as you mentioned a letter of credit or individual liens on the unit, something along those lines. That, that's where I'm at. Um, and then the second thing that I want to also bring up is I'm not comfortable with looking at L.A. County and the prices of homes and condominiums in L.A. County. I mean, that includes Marina del Rey, Palo Verde, Pomona. Let's try to narrow it down to this region of the world. Glendale specifically, or even the Northeast, but let's let's have a true analysis of what uh, home prices are like uh, for this particular uh, exercise for his project and for other projects that come down the uh, pike. So we'll always have a measurable criteria as to what prices are doing in this part of the world. You can get it from MLS. Okay, just one second. Let's go to Councilmember Weaver. Yeah, but we're doing two things here. We're looking at the INLU in a general term for the entire right. redevelopment zone. That's one component. The waiver is totally something else, correct? And I, w I would just add, yeah, that's correct, Ms. Uh, Council Member Weaver, and I would just add that <laughs> in order to actually grant an individual waiver, you also have to adopt option number uh, six and, and number eight, because right, option six grants the, the authority to grant individual waivers or reductions, and then there's a separate motion if you wanted to go that route, or you could just... Uh, excuse me, provide this sort of global solution, and then that would apply to each project, including the project that's been uh, submitted here today. So to consider the waiver, we have to do six and eight. That's you want, if you want to do just an individual waiver, that's correct. Just for do six. For this just project. Do six. And I, can I, just one more comment, Mr. Mayor, too. Of course. Uh, Mr. Quintero's option sort of seems to be a combination of options seven and eight, which is to basically require the payment of the fee or posting of a letter of credit, which is uh, essentially as, uh, as good as cash, and that would, that would serve the same purpose. And it wouldn't have the same risk as a, uh, a, a lien on a deed of trust. So that's that's an option that, that can be taken. Okay. I'm um, sorry. Councilmember, you say again. Huh? You had, you had put your hand up there Did at one I? point. And, uh, uh, you, you lost Sorry, me. we can come back. Okay, uh, option, we have to deal with the in lieu fee, which, where is that in here? That's option, number six? Option eight. The waiver for the no, new no, project? No, just the regular in lieu fee. Oh, that's any of these options. So okay, so that's already it's, in it's, there. Essentially, it's option eight, as okay. what's been discussed here okay. so far. And, and, uh... Speaker said that the $35 is the cost of building. That's not the case. I, get to come it's, up, right. I wanted to discuss the data, That's the too. gap, right? That is the gap. That's the affordability gap. It's the gap between the market price and the affordable price. It, because right. the affordable the unit supports some value, uh, yes. I'm, I'm yet to see anybody build anything no. for $35. Bucks. No, okay. no. Okay. No, no. I never said that. <laughs> but thank you for asking that question. All also right. on the data, we can do the data as narrowly as you'd like. We would have to then do resale homes as well. The new data only comes up. So I just want to be clear. Then that's fine. We can do it 
yeah. to that narrow. We can do it to zip code or, or that kind of a level. Thank you. I'm, I'm fine with Mr. Quintero's uh, way of doing it. Uh, the only thing I would like to do is ask the developer, does he understand what we're doing and does he concur with it? Because but this will be just an exercise in futility. He is here, fortunately, so let's... No, totally I don't understand number eight okay, and what it says. You know, in, uh, the understanding says in the front of the, in the end we're going to pay this amount of the money. It's and not, if it's not, if we can't uh, build it and and the loss is this, and I'm taking already risk for $500,000, I can't take. I'm, I'm, I appreciate, you know, your comment all, but I think, you know, there's each time and in different world and different situation, you know, the break for everybody. You know, there's people came from outside of Glendale and they received $75, $75 million, you know, uh, they have break. We are here. We are developing city of Glendon for 30 years. We have a right to have some break. I, I appreciate. L l l Dr. Kamenuki, before you don't go too far, because there may be some other questions. But what we're trying to do is find a way to ensure that some housing, yours, may be built in an area that is that we all agree is beneficial to the city. But we're trying to find a way that works globally for everyone, not just for you in particular. So let's, before we ask any more questions, let's go back to our city attorney, have him sort of run through this, restate it. Let's see where we are. Okay, Mr. Mayor, I, th I think the option that's sort of been presented, as, as explained by Mr. Quintero, is that the in-lieu fee be paid at the time of certificate occupancy, either by payment of the fee or a letter of credit in the amount of the fee. Uh, that fee can be rebated. Um, by uh, the developer selling the units within a certain absorption period that's defined in the option, um, and that 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 rebate is a pro rata share based on each unit selling, um, and then the uh, that the rebate is based on the assumption that the the survey or the uh, economic analysis shows that a fee for an ownership project is not feasible, and that that uh, study would be based on uh, looking at local sales as opposed to the LA County sales. I think that's the option as as we have it now. Okay. No motion's been made, but that's that's All the assumption right. I'm working under. Do you understand? Before, before we go further, let me ask. I understood what uh, uh, city attorney saying, but how about at that time the price is is not you can't sell it. You can't going to rent it for five years or ten years. How my position is going to be? Should I going to pay this amount of the money? Or I'm going to skip it for 10 years. When I sell it after 10 years, I'm going to pay the amount of the money. Now the fee would, the fee could only be rated, rebated during the absorption period for this for it this project. Would be essentially a year. Basically, would defer the fee. Well, if I, if I going to, defer. if the uh, prices of the condominium, even after I build it, is going to be for loss, I'm not going to pay it. I'm not going to sign any paper that I'm going to guarantee one million dollar, and I'm losing already another one million dollar and putting all. My investment in Jeffrey. No, uh, Council Member uh, Yusufian. I think, and uh, correct me, this is what happens. You're finished. You go and give a letter of credit for a million dollars. You start selling their units. As you sell your units, you show that there's a loss. So when the shows of loss, it's based on the performa. And you come in and you say, I sold these things for $450,000. I actually lost money. And they do an analysis and say, in this market, in Glendale, those units are selling for $450,000. He's right, he's losing money. You sold 10 units. So for those 10 units, the value of the in lieu fee was something like, let's say, $190,000. City of Glendale writes you a check for $190,000 and gives it back to you. He says, since you lost money, you don't pay the in-lieu fee. But you understand what I'm saying? I understand. Saying? Okay. If you made money, the then bit, you don't. That's, I'm not sure. I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not sure that's the motion. Well, or, I, or the, the I think that's how he's I think the only thing that, that yeah. slightly incorrect was the issue of um, a, the developer presenting a performer. We base, we base no, whether no, or not the, no, the fee. No, that's based on her. Correct. That's right. 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 And that's mean when would this... I'm losing five hundred thousand dollar when I come and sell it, okay? And still you and I pay I pay one million dollar, one half million dollar, then I gonna wait until I sell each project 
and money I make money or lose money, I'm going to get my refund. And, and you have to do it within what, no, one year? I don't year? think that's... What, what the proposal is now is you have four units per month absorption rate, so it would be one year for this size of project. Yeah, so you have to sell them all in one year. I think one year is way too ambitious. I mean, yeah. I think two I, years, I, two I, years I, to I, me, I think. even that is throwing the dice, but one year is just not, that's not a lot. Thank you very much. I think, uh, you know, uh, Mr. City Manager. Well, I was, I was going to say, I think Mr. Quintero has, has hit the key issue both for Dr. K as well as you all in setting policy, and that is that period of time that you would allow him to take to sell the units. He's indicated that he wouldn't plan on selling the units at any time if he's going to take a loss on them, right. uh, which, which in his example, the extreme could be he rents them for five or ten years. If he rents them for five or ten years, he's done a rental project. He hasn't done an ownership project. So the key is what is that period of time you'd give him to sell his units or essentially forfeit his, his uh, in lieu fee? And if a year is too short, then we'd need to have a period of time that's acceptable to you and acceptable to Dr. K. Okay. Anything to add? No, I'm just okay. the the four units uh, per month was just was a, the suggestion of uh, Ms. Head. So right. I mean, she may be able to speak further if there's an additional time. All right. And Let me turn to my colleague, Councilmember Najarian. Uh, I'm listening to what everyone is saying. I just don't think we're all on the same page here. Uh, we've spent a lot of time working on a waiver to get to this point. We've spent a lot of time in giving it to Kaiser Marston to analyze. We've spent an hour and a half trying to analyze this. But I just am getting the feeling that uh, unless it's something that that is in any way acceptable to the developer, uh, I don't want to send you out to go through and do an ordinance and all this and have the developer say, well, this isn't at all what I was expecting or what I'm willing to do. I'm not going to build at this point. I, honestly, uh, I think that the developers because I heard him say no waiver, waiver, no build. Or I right. mean, that was I, as clear I, as it yeah. could be. I'm not sure if this is getting closer to something he can work with. You'd have to ask him. I okay. think he's been very clear that he's requested right. a waiver of the fee as opposed to right. a deferral. Yeah, that's what I heard. I'm going to go to Mr. Khan because this is a very unusual. Uh, it's a very unusual uh, thing we're doing here, anyway. Uh, and we are hashing this out mostly right here on the dais. We might as well get the input from everybody involved here. So, uh, Thank you, and I'll be brief. All right. um, w when we came in today, we hadn't seen option eight. So when you see Dr. Karmanuki and asking these questions, we haven't had a time to process this. There are, there are a number of questions that kind of roam through my head as I'm looking at this as well. Do you care to share those roaming questions? Uh, <laughs> Random. I don't know if anybody can follow the way I think or my logic, so I'd rather not. Um, but I think it would probably be beneficial for us, for, for the developer, for Dr. Karmanukian, for us to have a chance if, and I don't know what your schedule is like next week, and I don't know if this can be continued one week, for us to be able to look at this to analyze it, to ask the questions of the staff and of the consultant and, and get the answers satisfactory back to us so that we can stand up here and say, yes, we can live with this, or no, we can't. Well, let me, let me just stop for one second here. Sure. And turn again to the city manager and the city attorney. Uh, the extension that we were able to get to have time to agendize this and discuss it uh, who was the individual? Was it Stuart Tom who was the individual? The official. Official. Build the in complete control of the building official. Right. So let me let me ask. I mean, is it possible since we we are? At, I mean, the council. My view is, and this is what I was actually asking a little while ago when I was pointing out there's 12 days. I do agree with Councilmember Najarian. I think that there needs to be some time to sit down and think this out for all of us, but also for Dr. Karmanukin. He's being asked here on the fly to to commit to something uh, that's obviously a major a major investment and a major risk. And and quite frankly, you're hearing from my colleagues up here uh, variations of what they think they're hearing and how it will play out. What I was hearing uh, Councilmember Yusufian stating uh, and and uh, uh, Ms. Head nodding up and down, a council member in Ajarian is saying that's not what I understand. That's not how I would characterize it. What I'm hearing from council member Quintero is not what I'm hearing council member Yusefian saying. So, uh, you know, 
rather than do this on the fly, is there the possibility that we can have the time to do this right instead of just a, in a rush? Well, I think you have all the time you need to set a broader policy. As it relates to Dr. K's project, yes. I think the answer is no, you don't have any more time than the building mm -hmm. officials granted. I met with Stewart at length mm -hmm. when he granted yes. the 30 days. It pressed him a lot to do that because he has lots of these requests to extend the time frame, lots and lots of them. And what he finally told me was, I will grant to Dr. K on his project what I've granted to others. And if he goes further, then he's going to have a whole host of people that he has said no to be clamoring at his door as to why <laughs> that one and not another one. So my suggestion is we should take the intervening week and focus on Dr. K's request. You've got time to deal with the broader policy. If you're going to authorize a waiver for Dr. K, provided the conditions are acceptable to you and to him, we should spend the time this week to do that and bring you back something that might work. All right, let me say this. Uh, uh, there are various uh, uh, interests that are being addressed here. Dr. K's interest is, is one, but it is also of a, of a broader uh, issue altogether. And it was, as was t uh, expressed by the chair of the Housing Authority uh, in an interview in the paper, that is, it's a broader issue that we're looking at. It's mm -hmm. just that this case has brought that to light and it's placed us here. Uh, so let's do this right rather than try to craft something that we're not all quite grasping, especially the individual project that's brought us here in the first place. Uh, can we can we come back to this uh, next week? And we'll have the opportunity to look at, at reports ahead of time. Uh, Dr. Karamanukin will have the opportunity to look, look at what this is and what it would mean to him and his finances and so on. And then we can do this from a more educated standpoint. Yes. I think in, in doing that, we'll focus on this particular project, but recognizing that what we do here will likely be a template yes. for how you would address your policy Should for. Yeah. I'd, wanna, I'd, I'd like to have a confirmation that we are talking about for sale housing. We have some very large rental projects. I don't want them holding up, submitting their plans and pulling their building permits because they're thinking, aha, if I wait another month, I might get a break on my fees for rental housing. Now, That's I, not a message we want to send. Uh, I, I um, thank you, uh, Mr. City Manager. That is quite correct. But part of what you said is the very reason I was asking about a further, um, a further uh, a delay. It is not just Dr. Karamanukian's project as an abstract, which is what Stuart Tom was talking about. We are looking at this, and based on what on this particular issue uh, and the issues surrounding his development, we're creating a broader policy. And it's not that he's asking; I'm asking. Uh, you know, I don't know whether there's support for that, whether we even need to go there. But it's not that Dr. K is asking; it's that I'm asking because. You know, I'm chairing this meeting, and I'm hearing five different versions of of, uh, of uh, item eight, which is deferred. This is the the newest one that was added, uh, as we found out. It 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 was conjured up uh, on a car ride between Huntington Beach and Glendale, and uh, you know we're trying, Dr. Chairman, we're trying to figure it out also. Uh, so thank you. You know, I, I don't see it as just a developer coming and asking for an exception. Um, uh, I'm chairing the meeting, and I, I feel that I need it because, uh, I mean, if we can accomplish it in 12 days, fine and dandy. But, um, you know, if you, if you uh, as a city manager and, and the city attorney, want to tell me that, yes, in 12 days we can handle this and digest it and be ready to, to come to a conclusion and vote, fine. But I think that if we need five more days, we should be able to have five more days. Where? You know? Where? Yes, sir. Could I make a recommendation or a motion to postpone this item to next week with no further delay? Second it. All right. Very good. Any question or debate amongst the the uh, no assembled the bodies? Uh, we've given guidance. And okay. Direction. All right. Uh, I think we have cons uh, consensus on that, Mr. City Attorney. Okay. All right. We adjourn for. Oh, well, you want to one, call for? Hang on one second. Do you have a motion? No, we've, I don't think we do. Yeah, I oh, a motion, motion to continue. Yes, we have a motion and a second. Yes, Mr. Six. Next week with no further per, comments. Let's, uh, no further notice. notice. Or uh, council. council. Yes. Council members in adjourning. Yes. Quintero. Yes. Weaver. Aye. Yousefian. Aye. Mayor Graham. Yes. Make the same motion for redevelopment agents. Second. Roll, please. Agency members, Draymond. Yes. Quintero. Yes. Weaver. Aye. Yousefian. Aye. 
Chairman Najari. Yes. The same motion for Housing Authority. Second. Roll call. Authority members Draymond. Yes. Mincy. Yes. Majorian. Yes. Brazen. Yes. Montero. Yes. Weaver. Aye. Chairman Yusuf. Aye. Motion to adjourn for council. Second. Second. Council is adjourned. Motion to adjourn for redevelopment. Second. Agency is adjourned. Motion to adjourn for housing. Second. Second. Agents, uh, uh, housing agents, housing authority uh, <laughs> adjourned. Thank you all very much.